I had the year previously. She had died. In the early 1970s, I went to the flagship Apollo. I believed in it all. I really believed this is a way to help people. I think most people got into it as a way, oh my goodness, you sit down with someone and they talk from the heart and they get better. I believed in it all. And I went off to the Apollo and a bunch of us trained directly under L. Ron Hubbard. Our folders went, BC confessional folders went to him. Every single new breakthrough he made was read out to us at 8.30 sharp in the morning in the internship and so on. And I trained like no one else. It was hard. It was brutal. It was long hours. And the Scientology training levels are hierarchy. I went up to as high as it, you could go, class 12, and then class 12 CS, class 12 case supervisor. I don't think the church has produced more than eight people on planet Earth that trained up to this level. The ship was not able to sustain itself because every single port eventually kicked out the ship. There was this funny rumor that these local inhabitants thought it was a CIA ship. And again, it was very deceptive. It didn't use the word Scientology Dianetics. It used the word OTC, Operation Training Corps. Uh, some Operation Transport Company. Oper thank you, yeah. thank you. Operation Transport Company. And nothing added up, you know, just... It just didn't add up in ports. The way we looked and it didn't look, it wasn't cargo and yet it wasn't, it didn't fit into, it wasn't a cruise ship and nothing, nothing added up. So one day, I don't know what happened, but in the island of Madeira, off the coast of Spain, the locals went into a rampage and started stoning the ship. This was the rock concert, as they call it. Yeah. It was bad, and uh, the ship had to pull out. Anyway, after that, it was decided that it no longer was safe to go from port to port. So the ship, like a thief in the night, crossed the Atlantic with all lights switched off. It was pitch blackness. And the ship Apollo was supposed to arrive in Charleston, Virginia. But the FBI was waiting for the Apollo right at the harbor. And the Guardian's office telexed and alerted it, and the ship quickly diverted to the Caribbean. The ship eventually arrives in Daytona. And I was constantly sent on mission. A mission is a specific objective. I think it, I think the word is taken from the military, where you do a certain mission, yes, yeah. right? Mission. Or you do a tour for yeah, six mission months. Mission orders. Yeah. Mission orders. And on one of my missions, I was in Los Angeles for some weeks. Some Guardian's office staff kind of nudged, he, he, he were, hey, there's a single girl in town, class 12, Karen de la Carriere. And they placed Heber and me to sit beside each other at scheduled meals. And Heber and I started talking. And Heber's first wife, 
was probably one of the most loved Scientologists of all time, Yvonne Jentsch. Yvonne was were truly one of a kind. And um, she had died the year previously. I had the utmost love and respect for Yvonne. Heber was going downhill at the time I met him. Anyway, Heber and I got married in 1978. And it was a big hoopla at the Flagland base. And I was stuck in Scientology. There is no thought that when you're married, you should be in the same location as your husband. That does, that's just not part of Scientology philosophy. You are there to slave for the church. You love only the church. Husband, schmusband. So for the first two, three years, three years of our marriage, I was stuck. Was it two, three years? A couple of years? I was the class 12 case supervisor at the Flagland base. And Hebo was in Los Angeles. This was a long distance marriage. Eventually, long, long story, I got to LA. And um, Heber shared more and more of his life with me. He had come from a polygamist family of 58 brothers and sisters. His father had eight wives, and the children were used as a slave force. They worked the fields, they produced, and the father, a tyrannical man, punished them physically pretty horrendously. Heba often talked about spark plugs, which were used on the flesh if production wasn't high enough. And apparently it can act like an electrical jolt. So this was given to Heber and his brothers and sisters at a young age as punishment. When you've had a brutal childhood, I think that you become prey more so than other times to some movement which tries to envelop you and say, we are your friends, we will help you, and we will help soothe your past. Heber and I, um, had a lot of good times, happy times. But I started very early on, even in the early late 70s, becoming more and more upset with internal culture and internal punishment. Even in the early late 70s, upset. internal culture with upset even in the early late seven internal punishment and in
with internal culture. Internal punishment. Even in the early, late 70s, upset. and in internal culture with upset even in the early late seven internal punishment. and in what mm -hmm.